हेलो स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम बैक टू द लेक्चर्स इन द लास्ट लेक्चर आई स्टार्टेड डिस्कसिंग अबाउट एप्लीकेशन ऑफ स्टडी स्टेट फ्लोरसेंस एंड इन दिस लेक्चर अगेन आई विल कंटिन्यू विद दिस we were discussing in the last lecture how to know the thermodynamic parameter of conformational change i started with a protein and i discuss that we can know the delta g for protein stability protein stability is basically looked at by looking at the conformational change from नेटिव स्टेट टू डीनेचर्ड स्टेट और अनफोल्डेड स्टेट सो दिस इज द इक्लोब्रिया विच वी वी आर डिस्कसिंग अबाउट एंड इफ द डेल्टा जी फॉर दिस प्रोसेस इज नेगेटिव देन दिस प्रोसेस विल बी स्पॉन्टेनियस एंड प्रोटीन विल बी अनस्टेबल बिकॉज इट इज गोइंग फ्रॉम नेटिव टू अनफोल्डेड फॉर्म वैन डेल्टा जी इज पॉजिटिव इट मीन्स द प्रोसेस इज non spontaneous process is non spontaneous and that will tell you that n is more stable than u n form of the protein is more stable than u and thus protein is stable although i am discussing about the native to unfolded state equilibrium but you can think of several different kind of equilibria where one form changes to another form for example you can discuss about cis trans isomerism you can discuss about ring flipping for example you are going from one conformation to another conformation of cyclohexane from chair to boat or boat to chair similarly we can discuss about a uh, suppose uh, keto enol tautomerism keto enol tautomerism that is again two different forms of a same compound two different forms of the same compound so when you are trying to look at the thermodynamics you are basically looking at how one conformation is more prevalent than other conformation under certain set of conditions so that's what we do when we are looking at the protein stability we are looking at a conformational change from native to unfolded we calculate delta g under particular condition and if delta g is negative it means the reaction is spontaneous unfolded form is more stable whereas if delta g is positive it means native state is more stable Native state is more stable. Generally, to do this, we calculate the value of k first, and as you know, that k is equal to u by n for this process. K is equal to concentration of u by concentration of n, and that can also be written as fraction of unfolded form by fraction of native form, and this is related to your A spectroscopic signal, and that's what we discussed in the last lecture. A spectroscopic signal. So, just by measuring the total fluorescence intensity, look here. I am not talking about intensity due to unfolded form or native form. We related total fluorescence intensity to the ratio of fraction of unfolded form. and fraction of native form when we calculated uh, this ratio and related to k we can express the total signal total fluorescence signal or total signal due to any spectroscopic quantity and uh, like uh, absorbance so it is not only related to fluorescence it is also related to signal from signal uh, total signal from any spectroscopic uh, techniques so why at certain temperature means signal at certain temperature is equal to y 
due to negative form plus y d multiplied by exponential minus delta g by r t divided by 1 plus exponential minus delta g by r t. Here we mean by delta g naught. And so, your fluorescence intensity can be related to delta g of the process, delta g of this process, conformational change process. So, if you experimentally obtain profile of fluorescence signal with temperature, temperature you can fit this profile with this equation and that will give you value of delta g naught. You can also get the value of delta h m, delta c p and t m since delta g is related to this whole quantity which I discussed last time. So, not only you can calculate delta g naught, you can also know delta h m, t m, delta c p and delta c p. So, all this quantity can be calculated at a particular temperature just by non-linear fitting of this profile. We know delta g, we know delta h m and so we can calculate delta h at certain temperature because we also know delta c p. So, by using Kirchhoff equation and putting the value of delta h m and delta c p, we can get the value of delta h as at a given temperature. We all already know delta g at certain temperature t. So, now we have delta g at a given temperature, delta h at given temperature. So, we can know delta s of given temperature and so we can tell whether this process n to u if it is spontaneous, whether it is driven by entropy or if uh, whether it is driven by delta h, it is driven by enthalpy. We also need to know that y n is also dependent on temperature, y n and y d is also dependent on temperature. So, we cannot put simply y n at certain temperature here because y n will change for each value of t and that is given by this equation y n at certain temperature is equal to y n naught plus m n delta t delta t and if you put in this equation you can have y n naught plus m n delta t plus y d naught plus m d delta t exponential minus delta g by r t 1 plus exponential minus delta g by r t and this is equal to y t and when you are trying to do nonlinear fitting you must keep this thing in mind and when you do that you can get the value of different thermodynamic parameter. So, there are some protein for which thermodynamic parameter has been reported. Our lab has already reported for certain proteins. So, these are the few proteins trypsin, chymotrypsin, lysozyme, cytochrome C and the thermodynamic parameter has been obtained for trypsin at pH 3, for chymotrypsin at pH 4, for lysozyme at pH 5 and 0 0.5 molar Ki and for cytochrome C it is taken at pH 4 and the thermodynamic parameter here is obtained using fluorescence spectroscopy. Thermodynamic parameter has been obtained using spectroscopy. You can also get the thermodynamic parameter using differential scanning calorimeter, but most of the time differential scanning calorimeter is not available in the lab. So, people depend on fluorescence spectroscopy and here what we do is we excite this protein at different lambda max value and that you can know by taking simple uh, fluorescence spectra and this is the T m value, this is delta H m value and this is the one obtained from calorimeter. These are the T m and delta H m obtained from the calorimeter. So, we can know the value of T m and delta H m using uh, fluorescence spectroscopy. You can see that T m obtained by fluorescence is quite close to 
a TM obtained by calorimeter DAC technique. Here you can again see chymotrypsin in this case TM is 330, whereas um, in case of DAC it is 331 Kelvin and this is 350 Kelvin for lysozyme which is 349.6 using calorimeter. So, you can see that we can almost get quite accurate value of TM and delta HM using fluorescence spectroscopy. We do not have to go to a calorimeter. So, one of the important application of fluorescence is to obtain the stability parameter for protein and similarly you can get the conformational change constant or you can say equilibrium co uh, constant for a conformational change whether you are looking for cis trans isomerism, whether you are looking for keto to enol transformation, we can get the value of k which is equilibrium constant for that conformational change and if we measure the k as a function of temperature, we can get the value of delta h and once we have delta g and delta h, we can know delta s value. So, fluorescence is not only used to know the protein stability or delta g not value for any conformational change, it can also tell you about effect of different conditions, different additives on that conformational change. For example, generally protein need to be stabilized, protein need to be stabilized for its longer self life and so people use additive to increase the stability of protein, increase the stability of protein and for that they do some studies, thermal stability and try to look at how those additive can stabilize the protein. So, for that uh, we can either try chemical denaturation and again we are looking at fraction unfolded versus uh, gonadium hydrochloride concentration which is a well known denaturant. You can also look at fluorescence with respect to temperature and you can see here that this is your protein in buffer and this is again protein in buffer, this red one is protein in buffer. If I put co-solvent and we see the shift to our right hand side, we know that your protein is more stable under that co-solvent condition or uh, on the addition of protein gets stabilized on the addition of an additive. So, here you can see that CM is almost here, it gets increased to this point and so your protein is more stable since more amount of denaturant is needed to unfold the protein. Here also you can see that this is the TM value and this is the TM value in presence of co-solvent and so there is increase in TM value in presence of co-solvent and that means uh, you require higher temperature to denature protein or uh, to convert protein from its native form to unfolded form and that is why we can see that now protein has got stabilized. We can also look at the effect of salt. This is one of the experiment done to look at the effect of salt on thermal stability of a protein called transforming growth factor. The data is obtained at pH 5, what you can see that this is your at 0 molar and this is at around 500 millimolar. Salt is known to destabilize or stabilize protein and in this case what you are looking at is TM is going from this position to this position and so there is a shift of TM towards higher temperature on addition of salt and what does that mean is salt is stabilizing 
the protein, salt is stabilizing the protein. And this is your thermodynamic parameter for stability. You can see that once I add salt, your T m value increasing, we can also get delta H m value, delta H m is also increasing and delta C p h n to a certain extent. So, we can know what is the effect of additive on a conformational equilibria by using fluorescence spectroscopy. There is a very important application of fluorescence in calculating binding affinity for a substrate ligand binding and substrate ligand binding is quite important. For example, if you are looking for a drug, you need to look at how does it binds to its target, how does it bind to its target. Similarly, in biochemistry, we also need to look at protein ligand binding, since protein ligand binding is, is a very important phenomena in uh, in uh, our body, no function in our body is possible without protein ligand binding and hence it is important to study substrate ligand binding. So, to know how to apply fluorescence to look at protein ligand binding, first we need to understand the basics of binding. Here I will start with protein as substrate and we will look at protein ligand binding, but this is equally applicable to any substrate binding with a ligand. Now, we will look at the simple process, one protein interacts with one ligand to give you protein ligand complex. There are two ways to denote its binding substrate binding to ligand, one is by using binding affinity or association constant K A will be given by P L divided by P into L. So, this is nothing but equilibrium constant of this process. There is a second way to denote this, but we look at the opposite of the equilibria P L going to P plus L and equilibrium constant of this process is known as dissociation constant and K d is given by P into L divided by P L is, and that is no, nothing but simply inverse of K value, inverse of K value. What does that mean is higher affinity is equal to higher K value or lower K d. So, if you get lower K d, it means substrate as higher affinity for ligand or ligand has higher affinity for substrate. Generally, if you look at unit of this K d, you will see that this is molar multiplied by molar divided by molar and so unit is either molar or millimolar or micromolar or nanomolar. So, unit of dissociation constant will be either in molar unit, millimolar, micromolar or nanomolar, whereas unit of K A is going to be molar inverse or millimolar inverse, micromolar inverse or nanomolar inverse. Since it is easy for us to denote the, the unit as a molar, millimolar, micromolar or nanomolar. So, generally we, generally we take dissociation constant as a measure of protein ligand affinity, but we need to keep in mind that if there is a lower value of K d, then it means there is a higher affinity of substrate for ligand or. Okay, so, to know this K d value or K a value, what we need to do first is to calculate the mole of bound ligand per mole of protein, which is given by this new value, which is basically fraction of binding on P that are filled by ligand. 
So, nu is bond protein by total protein. So, you see this is a fraction of bond protein and that can be written as fraction is equal to bond protein divided by free protein plus bond protein. So, when you add ligand some of the protein will go to bond state, the remaining protein will be in free state and so total protein is free protein plus bond protein. So, nu is given by P L which tells you about the concentration of bond protein divided by P plus P L. P is protein in free state and this P L denotes the protein which is in complex with ligand. Now, if you remember K A is equal to P L divided by P into L and so P L can be written as K A into P into L and that is what we are going to do. So, I just plug in this value of P L in this equation and what we will get is K A into P into L divided by P plus again if I put it here then I will get K into P into L. Now, you can see P is there in every terms in numerator or denominator. So, it will cancel out. So, if I remove all 3 P's I will get K into L divided by 1 plus K into L and if I try to write this same equation in terms of K D what I will get is nu is equal to L divided by K D plus L. So, this is your equation which tells you how the fraction of bond protein is related to K D. Now, if I plot this new value with the value of L, with the value of L what I am going to get is this kind of equation and that is not quite surprising because at higher concentration of ligand when ligand concentration is in excess all protein is going to be in the bond state and so the fraction of bond protein will be equal to 1 will be equal to 1 and if I take nu is equal to 1 by 2. So, this is for nu is equal to 1. If I take nu is equal to 1 by 2, I just put 1 by 2 is equal to L divided by K D plus L and so K D 2 L is equal to K D plus L and if I take L this side, I get L is equal to K D. So, what does that mean is K D is equal to ligand concentration when the fraction of bond protein is 0 0.5, fraction of bond protein is 0 0.5 and so K D is the concentration of ligand which saturates half of the total site on protein, but this is not an easy method, easy method would be to somehow get a straight line which can give the value of KD. So, let us see how to get a straight line to obtain the value of KD and the plot which we use to get the value of KD is known as SK chart plot. So, this equation we have already obtained nu is equal to L divided by KD plus L if you multiply this nu into L plus nu into K D is equal to L, divide the equation by L into K D, L into K D what we will get is here in this L will cancel out, K D will come at denominator in this K D will cancel out, L will come at denominator at this L will cancel out and K D will come in denominator. And if I take nu by k d this side what I am going to get is nu by l is equal to 1 by k d minus nu by k d. Now, we have a equation where I can plot nu by l versus nu by l versus nu and I can get a k d from the slope because this is a equation of a straight line. So, if I plot nu by l versus nu 
I will get a equation like this. So, slope will be given by minus 1 by k d, you will see here minus 1 by k d and the intercept will be given by 1 by k d. Basically, slope itself will give you minus 1 by k d. So, if I take inverse of this, I can get this a slope or from the intercept also I can get the value of k d. One thing you need to remember that plot must be linear for a standard 1 is to 1 interaction. If the plot is not linear, it means 1 is to 1 interaction is not followed and it means that more than one class of sites are present and there can be problem with the experiment. So, these are few short comings, but there are ways to get information for a different kind of model, but this is going to be out of a scope for this lecture. So, I will go ahead and discuss another application, but if you want, uh, I have given EDUSAT lectures on protein ligand binding. Please go to uh, those lectures. You can know if there is more than one site for the more than one site for the ligand, then how to get a sketch chart plot. So, if you look back, what we did, we plotted nu by L versus nu. So, one thing we need to know is nu value, nu value. And now, what I will show is how to get the value of nu from the spectroscopic signal, for example, from fluorescence. Once I know the nu value, I can just plot nu by L versus nu and I can get the value of KD for 1 is to 1 interaction. So, experimentally what we do is we take protein and then titrate with it with ligand and then measure fraction of protein bond to ligand and then we plot nu by L versus nu. Now, how to know the fraction of bond protein that is the main question which is obtained by experimental tools. The detection of complex can be done either through fluorescence or protection assay and in this lecture we are interested about how to use fluorescence to get the fraction of bond protein, fraction of bond protein. So, this is what I am going to discuss in this slide. So, you can think of that in the cuvet where there is a protein and I started titrating with ligand, the total fluorescence signal is going to come from come from three different species, one from protein, another from ligand and the last one from the formed complex, complex between protein and ligand. And again here I will denote y as a fluorescence signal and y t means total fluorescence signal. So, it consists of signal from protein, it consists of signal from ligand, it consists of signal from complex. And y p will give you signal from per molar free protein, per molar free protein. Okay. So, y p into concentration of p plus y l into concentration of l, again y l is signal from per molar ligand. So, if we take one molar ligand in a solution and then measure fluorescence intensity that will correspond to y l and then y p l is signal from per molar bond protein. So, one molar complex will give you signal and that is equal to y p l, y p l. And so, if we multiply y p into concentration of p, it means we are talking about total contribution from free protein, y l into l will give you total concentration from free ligand and y p l into p l will give you total signal from your complex 
and yt is total signal due to protein ligand and protein ligand complex. Sometime your signal is only from the bond protein, not from the ligand or not from the free protein at particular lambda max value. It is also important to keep in mind at that particular lambda max value whether th there is a signal from free protein or not, ligand, free ligand or not. So, if suppose your complex gives you signal at particular lambda max whereas other free protein or free ligand gives a signal at uh, signal at a different lambda max val value which is far apart from the lambda max at which complex absorbs or complex fluoresces, and then at that lambda max there is no contribution from free or free protein or free ligand. In that case we can take y p is equal to y l is equal to 0. So, y t will only be due to complex. So, what will happen that you will get something like that spectra. So, this is complex I started making and this is your signal y and this is your ligand concentration. So, what will happen that it will go and it will be constant because all of protein has gone to complex and after that you are just adding only ligand which does not contribute which does not contribute and so there will be a constant here and this value is called y infinity and y infinity will be y p l into p l max. So, this is the maximum amount of p l which can form and p l max will be equal to total protein concentration because after that formation when p t is equal to p l max after that no more complex is getting formed all the protein has gone to complex form and so y infinity is equal to y p l into p t and this is your one equation this is another equation you just divide this two these two equations so what i am doing is i am dividing this equation by this equation what i will get is y p l y p l will cancel out we have p l by p t is equal to y t by y infinity. So, y t by y infinity is equal to y p l y p l cancels out. So, p l by p t and that is what is here. And this is what is your fraction of bond protein and so now you know how to calculate fraction of bond protein. Then you go and plot nu by l versus nu you will get the value of k d this is equal to nu. Now, sometime signal is from free and bound protein ligand does not have any contribution in that case how does your how to calculate the fraction of bound protein. So, y is equal to in this case y is equal to y p into p plus y p l into p l this is from the protein, this is the signal from protein, this is the signal from complex. Now, what we can do is we can express p as p t minus p l. What does that mean is you know that total protein concentration is equal to free protein plus bond protein. p is either free or in complex form with l. So, this is called free protein and this is called bond protein, bond protein. So, this free protein is equal to P t minus P l, free protein is equal to P t minus P l that is what we have written here. Y p into free protein which is equal to P t minus P l plus Y p l into P l. Now, if I take y infinity signal when all protein has gone to complex then this is your free protein and so there is since there is no free protein we are talking about all protein has gone to complex form it means there is no free protein it means there is no contribution from this. So, y is simply y p l into p l max 
and we already discussed about PL max is nothing but concentration of total protein concentration of total protein and now you can see that uh, y0 when there is y0 we can also calculate the value of y0 y0 means we have not added the ligand when ligand concentration is 0 and in that case your none of the protein has gone to complexes means all of the protein is in free state and so there will be no contribution from the complex because complex has not been formed all complex is all signal is due to protein itself and protein is totally in the free form and so you can write y0 is equal to yp into total protein concentration so you have three equations first what we will do is we calculate y minus y0 when we do that so yp into pt this cancels out yp into pt cancels out what is left is pl into yp and pl into ypl so pl can be taken as a common and what is left is yp ypl since we are talking about y minus y not this cancels out so pl if we take then ypl minus yp similarly we can get y infinity minus y not and that is equal to this that is equal to this if you can see this has a same this term common term so if i divide y minus y not by y infinity minus y not i will simply get pl by pt which is nothing but fraction of bond protein fraction of bond protein so fraction of bond protein is equal to y minus y not divided by y infinity minus y not so now you can plot nu by nu by l versus nu and you can get the value of kd you can get the value of kd this is the way kd can be determined or k can be determined using fluorescence spectroscopy in fact you can use signal from you can use any signal from any spectroscopic technique which gives you which is basically proportional to the concentration of the fluorophore concentration of the fluorophore here i will show you one result where people have looked at the binding of ans with bovine serum albumin they use same equation y is equal to y max into ns divided by kd plus ns and by just fitting this curve they obtain the value of kd which is around 8.63 plus minus 0.29 micromolar so we can get the kd value using fluorescence there is another example where we have looked at how curcumin binds with a protein called superoxide dismutase 1 so this is your spectra so here is your curcumin pure curcumin and it is now titrated with sod 1 so what we are looking at how fluorescence signal from curcumin changes when we add sod 1 and here what we did is we applied the equation which we derived when we are discussing about static quenching and in case of static quenching we can use stern volmer equation so f not by f is equal to 1 plus ksb into q this is for your collisional quenching so uh, just remove this and there is one modified stern volmer equation i am not going to discuss that but that can also be used to get your ksv yeah here ksv is basically association constant if we are talking about static quenching so quenching can be due to simple collision 
of salt bond with curcumin and second can be due to your complex formation of ground state curcumin with salt bond. So first we have to look at whether it is a static quenching or dynamic quenching. If it is a static quenching then we can get the value of Ka. Okay, so this is the plot F0 by F versus curcumin concentration. If you remember Stone Volmer plot, so F0 by F versus curcumin and if I assume that this is a collisional quenching then we can get the value of Kq which is higher than maximal collisional quenching constant. So, we get a very high value of Kq and it means that it is not a case of collisional quenching. Collisional quenching, the value of obtained binding constant indicates moderate binding of curcumin to DTT, treated sort 1. What we did is in this experiment, we first tried to look at whether it is a static quenching or dynamic quenching and one thing I told you. Uh, to differentiate it between a static and dynamic quenching is measure lifetime in presence of quencher. If lifetime does not change in presence of quencher, it means it is a case of a static quenching and that is what we did and what we found is uh, your um, lifetime of curcumin does not change in presence of sod 1, it means it is a case of your uh, static quenching. And from this plot and slope, I can get the value of association constant, dissociation, association constant or dissociation constant. And what we got in this case is there is a moderate binding of curcumin. The KD value is in micromolar range, which means it is a moderate kind of binding. Fluorescence can also be used for calculation of kinetic parameters. Kinetic parameters, if you remember kinetic parameter for measuring rate constant we used to get, we used to, we utilize the integrated rate law and this is the rate law for 0 order, this is rate law for first order, this is rate law for second order. And if you look at, we need to measure A value in all these. So, concentration at a given point we need to measure, but it is very difficult to measure A, concentration of A at particular point in the reaction or during if you are looking at reaction with temperature, it is very difficult to measure concentration of a particular species at a particular species at a given point. So, what we generally do again we take help of a spectroscopy to measure concentration or particularly measure concentration ratio and I will show you how by measuring total spectroscopic signal you can get the ratio of concentration and that can be used to calculate the value of rate constant. For example, take a simple case A going to P, A is a reactant, P is a product. At time T, we started with A mole and P is 0. At time T, it is A minus X, so X will be the product and T is equal to infinity. A goes to 0 and product will be A. Now, think of the spectroscopic signal. A spectroscopic signal will be given by K A into A, where K A is a spectroscopic signal due to 1 mole of A. So, Y T will be K 1 into A minus X plus K 2 into X and K 2 is your small K 2 is your spectroscopic signal due to 1 mole of P, 1 mole of P and this is a spectroscopic signal per mole of A. So, total spectroscopic signal at time t will be k1 multiplied by a minus x plus k2 multiplied by x 
and when t is equal to infinity your signal will be only due to product and so y infinity will be k2 into a. So now we have three signals at three different point. So now let us do y t minus y infinity. If you do that you will get k1 minus k2 into a minus x and if you do y 0 minus infinity you can get k1 minus k2 into a. And so if I divide y t minus y infinity by y 0 minus y infinity I will get a minus x by a. So the concentration ratio of a at two different time at time t is equal to 0 and time t can be obtained by measuring fluorescence intensity at different point. You can try of different reaction for example A going to B plus C same thing will be obtained same thing will be obtained you can try yourself at home. But what we need to know that A minus x by A is equal to y t minus y infinity by y 0 minus y infinity. So now we can write first order equations first order equation is what log A naught by A is equal to log A by A minus x is equal to kt and we have already calculated this ratio we I wrote A minus A by A but you can write also A by A minus x and that is equal to y0 minus y infinity by yt minus y infinity and so now you see I do not need this just by having the uh, your signal spectroscopic signal in this case fluorescence at different time I can know this ratio and now I can plot simply log y t minus y infinity versus t to get the value of k to get the value of k rate constant. For a second order equation we know this is integrated rate law what we need to do is we need to express this equation as a ratio of a by a naught or a naught by a. The way we can do is just multiply this whole equation by a naught. So, we will get a naught by a minus a naught by a naught which is 1 is equal to k t into a naught. A naught we generally know we our problem is to measure a at different time during the reaction. So, we can write a naught by a is equal to k t a naught plus 1 and this already we have calculated in the earlier slide and that is equal to y0 minus y infinity by yt minus y infinity and that is kt a naught plus 1. So, now we can just plot yt minus y infinity or y0 minus y infinity by yt minus y infinity versus t to get the value of k. So, a spectroscopic signal not only gives us a tool to measure delta G, K, delta H or delta S, it also gives us a tool to measure the kinetic parameters, kinetic parameters. So, I will stop here and thank you very much. Next time we will discuss the time resolved spectroscopy. These are the some references. So, thank you. Thank you.